Woman, won't you find your voice? Oh, oh woman, won't you find your soul? Woman, won't you find your voice? Oh, oh woman, won't you find your soul? All children are born with a sense of justice. It's not fair is one of the first things that the children say, yeah, along with no. Um, and I think it's sad that very often circumstances, upbringing, privilege, trains that sense of innate justice out of people. And in my case, I guess I was fortunate that both my parents had very strong senses of, of, uh, of justice and fairness. And so I don't remember when I didn't have a sense that things were fair or not fair. And of course, in my childhood experience, um, I didn't, I'm the eldest child. I didn't actually have a brother until I was nearly 25. So it was mostly in my childhood experience my cousins or my friends who had brothers and who weren't allowed to do this and that but the boys were okay but also and they were at the same time things like you know I come from a relatively privileged background okay my father was one of the first two two doctors in northern Nigeria my mother was the first girl in her family to go to university and my grandmother never forgave her her parents for not letting her go, okay. Um, but her father, as was, I don't know, all the boys always went to university, okay, so he was at the University of Shanghai, okay. Um, but the children of the cook didn't get to go to school, I mean, I was a child, didn't have nice clothes, didn't have, you know, they shared my toys because they didn't have any toys of their own. And so that, that sense of this isn't fair, but not around many different lines of unfairness. Certainly I don't remember ever not having it. Um, certainly by 16, 17, I was engaged in organized activities with what was then called the, conscious, the Women's Consciousness Raising Movement. Um, I, by 18, I was also in what we called the Black Socialist Alliance. I, I was at university in the UK then. So, so already patriarchy, racism, and capitalist exploitation were things I was very clear about. I think probably the first time I formally called myself a feminist, I was formally self-identified as a feminist, was when I was probably 19 or 20, and we're talking here about the late 1970s, so the term didn't have quite so much currency then as it did now. For me, it is a form of feminism that does two things at the same time. One, it is it places us as African women at the centre of the thinking and the activism and the campaigning that we do. Um, and it places us in a position where we can reclaim the history of the women who have been struggling in Africa long before the word feminism was heard about, whether it was on an individual level or a community level or what we now call the nation state or an, at global level. And it enables us to recover, it, it makes us want to go and recover that history because it's often a covered over history. And it enables us to be able to ground the action that we do, the, the thought that we have, and say it's ours, okay? Feminism did not come to us. We have had roots of feminism, and we contribute also to the development of feminism in the world, globally, okay? So it goes both ways, yeah. The second thing is that the particular, there are many forms of feminism, and I suspect there are also African women who don't have exactly the form, but the form of feminism that I like to hold, and that the AFF, the African Feminist Forum also holds, is a form that takes on board the need to contend all forms of exploitation, marginalisation, exclusion, um, discrimination against all women. And in doing that, because women share several categories, 
with men also, it actually takes on the need to struggle against social injustice, economic injustice, and so on, along a whole number of different dimensions, which include, of course, first and foremost, patriarchy, but also economic exploitation, both in globalization, capitalist exploitation, um, heterosexism and the discrimination against diverse sexualities, um, racism and white supremacism, but also ethnic and chauvinisms of all kinds. So for me those are the two strands, if you like, of African feminisms. Women in Nigeria Win was started in 82 and it was the first feminist organisation. And even then it was what's today called an intersectional organisation. It recognised that women were oppressed as a gender category, but also by virtue of their membership in the peasantry, the working class, etc, etc, and that both needed to be taken on together at the same time as looking at Nigeria as a, 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 an outpost of neo-colonial globalism. <laughs> so, so, you know, it was always intersectional. Um, and the contribution that Wynne made, I think, was in a number of different areas. One, it was the first organisation that did research, and doc including both documentation and analysis, to support the arguments and feelings that many people had about women's dis discrimination against women. Okay, because otherwise they'd say, ah, oh, you're getting emotional, or you're the brainwash for the West or whatever it is and so there we were we did the research we did the documentation so we could wave it at people and say no actually this is the situation so it was very very useful probably how many of us seven or eight of us who started working around developing the African Feminist Forum um, and coming out of you know, other experiences of trying to build continental-wide links for feminists in Africa, um, and which obviously didn't always go well because they're not in existence now, but coming out of that, we thought it was really important to keep the idea of the links, the solidarity, the space for feminists in Africa to be able to work on issues that are African, to support each other, to develop analyses, um, but to be very clear about the bases on which we were doing that. So hence the development of the Charter, the Principles of African Feminism. Um, and then out of that, it was uh, a snowball thing. People who liked the idea, and who do you know who would also be interested, um, I was responsible for developing the programme of the first three feminist forums. So this is the first year I haven't had to do it myself. And whoa, all kudos to Jessica and the Zimbabwe team, thank you. <laughs> so, but the thing I like best about this particular meeting is that every year, I mean not every year, every forum that we've had, we've managed to bring on new people. So it's not just the same old faces recycling. Yeah. Um, and we've also managed to be more conscious and proactive about many different sorts of diversities. Okay, I think between the first and, and this forum, um, we have much been able to improve representation from North Africa, from Francophone Africa, from young women, from women of diverse sexualities, uh, women of disabilities. Um, not perfect, but getting better, getting there, and trying to put practice into the principles that we've had since the beginning uh, of doing that. I think the feminist, the national feminist forums are a really good way to go. Um, I think that it's, it's good that we're not focused on, you know, this is an organisation, so you have a feminist forum, which is a chapter of, okay. But the fact that people are wanting to take back the principles but to use them in, their, in the work that they're already doing as feminists and activists rather than having to set up yet another formal structure that is looking for you know, yet, yet more funding. I think that's the most important thing and that's the way that we need to go. 
also what it did was bring to the fore the legitimacy of talking about oppression against women, fighting for rights of women, of talking about paying attention to what women are doing in agriculture, in, you know, in the factories, of pointing out things like um, in one uh, factory in Zaria, made bicycles, the labor union and the workers were about 50-50 women and men, probably a little bit more men than women. Anyway, the labor union had managed to uh, negotiate a bicycle loan from management for workers. This is an area of the country where women don't ride bicycles and they couldn't understand why we said that's fine but you also need to have a transport allowance or something that people can take in lieu of the bicycle allowance because otherwise you're not defending the interests of the women who are workers in this. And yeah, that was totally, it had never occurred to them. At a pan-African level, the existence of the Maputo Protocol is absolutely the work of feminists. It was fought for by feminists, it was drafted by feminists. And the fact that the protocol is in fact Clearly it builds on CEDAW, the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against All Women, but the Mepito Protocol actually goes beyond it in many ways. And one of the reasons, obviously, is that you know, it was 20, 30 years since CEDAW was passed, so we've learned more things. Okay? But the other thing is that because it's focused around African realities, it could pick up things that, this, that CEDAW, which is a more general document, did not do. So I think we can be very, very proud of the Maputo Protocol. Um, the couple of countries, Africa has a relatively high rate of the adoption of the protocol and the ratification. What we need to do now, of course, is move into, in some countries, the protocol has to be um, formally adopted before it becomes law. In some cases, it has to be domesticated in different ways. That's one of the issues. The second issue, of course, is that even when it's something's formal law, you need policies for implementation, you need resources, you need people who understand what it's about in order to implement it, you need monitoring, and so on. So that's a stage we have yet to get to, unfortunately, and we do, but we do need to work on it. The uh, United Nations uh, conference on uh, human rights in Vienna. There was then uh, the uh, tribunal and uh, I was there but the two people who presented it, one was an African woman at Florence Bidegua along with Charlotte Bunch and you know the work that went into finding the women who would and help in supporting them and helping them prepare their testimony was one that feminists from around the world, including Africa, participated in. Um, so I think the UN Declaration Against Violence Against Women, we certainly contributed to that. The, uh, the Beijing Platform of Action, the, the chapter on the girl child, directly comes from African feminists. It wasn't even on the agenda before that, before the 1994 um, preparatory meeting for Beijing. Um, so. You know, at the global level, I think we can share in the, the triumphs, such as they are, of feminism working together, okay? But we also have local, um, local gains, local wins, that we need to build on and push further for. So. There are actually lots of sites of work and many different levels of work. And I wouldn't say that any of them are illegitimate, okay. What I would say though is that I think that there are three areas that it might be m most productive for us to, to start deepening our work in, okay. One is to s deepen the ways and the, the level at which we work with women in local communities or with women's groups in local communities, okay. Um, at two levels. One is that feminists working with local groups obviously brings feminist frameworks, feminist ways of action, feminist objectives to those groups. 
But the second is that working on the ground, so to speak, helps ensure that the frameworks that we have are adequate to the purpose. Okay, so, you know, it's not we're raising their consciousness or that or only the grassroots can speak, but that need for, to have the interaction, the, the synergy, okay. Um, which then means that there is a wider base of people who, whether or not they use the label, have the ideas that bring um, liberation, a better life, choices, autonomy and hope to more women and also to more men as it happens. Um, so then building up, no not building up, building up and down across different levels of community work, so that's one level. The second though is to build the links between people working in different sectors of social justice. Okay. Um, I think that not perfect but the feminist movement, by and large, takes intersectionality more seriously than many other social justice movements. Okay, um, but I think that it is important to recognise that feminists working with or on other social justice issues, yeah, ec uh, class, economic exploitation, the tax justice movement, democracy and, and development. Uh, the environmental movement, okay, the, the uh, movement against heter heterosexisms, okay, all of them. Feminists working there need to be able to bring to other movements the ne absolutely necessity of intersectionality in feminism, but also in all of the other movements, so that whatever pushback or gains that we have are done in ways that, again here, does not mean a pushback there. That we're holding the line on everything, even if we can only push, you know, depending on the particular conjuncture, what's happening somewhere, you might only be able to push on this at the moment. But that we're holding the line everywhere else and eventually we'll all be able to move, rather than moving on and leaving other people behind. Okay. Um, and that has to be good for all of us, okay, because we need everything, we need all of it together. We know about a couple of icons, but we don't know about the, you know, hundreds and thousands, millions of women who've been doing things um, less in the public eye or less in a time when there was mass media that, you know, caught them for a sign fight. So I would say Gumbo, Gumbo Sawaba and Ladi Shehu, who were both active in the um, Northern Elements People's Union, the Napu Women's Wing, which was one of the part, well, the most radical populist party in the Nigerian independence struggle. Okay. Um, Gombo Sawaba, for example, was imprisoned 16 times by the British for her part in the independence struggle. Okay. Um, and so they were part of the, a general independence struggle, but they were also, and very clearly and consciously, calling for things like an end to early marriage, um, schooling for all girls, uh, the end to uh, seclusion for women, um, and, and an end to feudal uh, aristocracies. Okay, so those two, I think, are people who are sheroes and who could be recognised. Um, at another level, and this is a woman whom, whose name I don't even know, um, a teacher in Meiduguri, who insisted that she had to have girls as well as boys in her class because the north of Nigeria, it was not until the last decade or so, that we had uh, equal numbers of girls in school as boys. Okay. There was always many more boys in, in school than girls. and so. In the, in the early 60s, 70s, 70s, she was already insisting that she had girls in her classroom. And at the same time saying that the custom of taking off your shoes before you went to see the local Emmy or so on should be absolutely rejected because it was an example of class exploitation. I don't even know her name, but having heard about her when I was, mm -hmm. you know, in university, I was like, wow, this can be done. 
So we have lots of shiros like that, and it would be really nice the more we can recover them, and the more we can talk about them so that they can inspire other people too. So. power your soul baby don't let them tell you that this isn't yours cause you are yours your voice your power your soul your voice your power your soul your soul your voice your power your soul oh, oh woman won't you find your voice Say, woman, won't you find your soul? Cause this is yours, oh baby, you are yours. Your voice, your power, your soul. Your voice, your power, your soul.